Welcome to Common Man Cocktails, I'm your host Derek Schoeman, I've got with me the Kurd. The Kurd takes up boss space. He's like right there. You mean Vogue? No. Vogue. I don't. Vogue. Okay. Wait, is that what we have to do now? Well, I just wanted to know how much space I had. Oh. <laughs> oh, okay. You have a big head compared to mine. God, it's big everything. I get it, okay? I get it. <laughs> Anything oh. compared to you is big, Derek. Oh, oh. Anyone. <laughs> <laughs> you need to change. You need to go on to a, an actual nominative noun. No, that's not how you say it. Anyway, what we're going to be doing today is this is a special episode. we got five cocktails. Don't even think that this is going to take one of those slots. We're doing a very special episode because the Kurd is here to dump the knowledge on your brain holes. Your face. That's not really So a we thing. went from mouth, hole, mouth holes to brain holes. Well, I mean, you don't dump knowledge on mouth holes. Yes, you, you do. <laughs> That's not called knowledge. Uh, so, Excuse me, miss. Uh, I'd like to give you some knowledge. <laughs> I want to show, I'm going to spread my knowledge uh, through genealogy. <laughs> she gets done, she's like, that wasn't smart at all. <laughs> oh, I got more haters. I got totally like, I hate you guys. We got one guy who's racist. We got another guy who, whatever he said the week before that, that oh, he was wearing a communist shirt. Apparently, communist is an in insult. So, whatever. I'm going to do the, the, the. You know what? That's how you know the show's growing. But yes. you know what? We'll talk about that in the middle of going through <laughs> or whatever we're shrinking. Doing. Or shrinking. No, yeah. no. <laughs> Statistically, no. It's only getting more awesome. And to make sure it gets awesome, we're going to drink crap tons of whatever you got in front of me. What are we doing? Okay, so. It's in the title, but I can't <coughs> take from here. Normally, I teach an hour class on the lineage of gin. And so, is this an hour? No. no, I have totally chopped this up. Normally, I would teach this at a conference for cocktails, but I got to the point where I was like, you know what? I, I'm giving bits and pieces of knowledge to the viewers when I come down here and do the show. I thought it would be really cool to do a show or two shows. Depends how we slice this thing up and do a comprehensive understanding of the morphology of gin. And it's a really kind of a, a cool topic because it gives you an idea of where gin started at and where gin's at now and kind of like how the subcategories of gin each play into each other. And there's also like really cool stories in between that. Are they really cool? Nah, no, probably not. There's, I'm, there, I'm just nerdy about alcohol, so I'm like, I'm oh my god, that's so cool. Yeah, but you've got people that are watching. See, here's the thing. Yeah. The people that aren't nerdy about this stuff, because of what the title says and some of the description they may see, What are we going to call this? Gone. Are we going to just say like... I don't know. This is your job. Can, no, I thought I'm you just like, here in the glowy shirt. Like uh, the history of gin. <laughs> history of that's what it's gonna be. Sure, why not? I mean, is that, uh, I, I'll SEO it better. What, what did Python be called it? Like the history of Brian, or what it was that? Was that the name of it? Life, life of, of Brian. Brian. Yeah, so we just life of gin. The life of gin. Yeah, I'm good with that. All right, all right. Well, I gotta cool. remember that somehow. Okay. Uh, gin, so that's life. on you. No. Edit. Oh. Edit. Not it. <laughs> The life of gin. Now on Common Man Cocktails, we're going to show you. Can we do this with other things besides gin someday? Yeah, I'm down with that. All right. Cause okay. It was, maybe we, yeah, that'd be awesome. Okay. Okay, so to kind of like get the whole party started, we are going to start with the misconception that, that all gin originated out London. of Holland. Oh, really? Yeah. See, you're, look, you're looking at it from somebody who's already nerdy enough to know that. Yeah. I would say it comes out of London because it's London dry gin. Well, that's a category. We'll get to that. No, no. No. My this friend. Is no, generalizing. No. I know. I think people think Take gin comes from London. It, you either have two people. You have the Derricks of the world that Which think probably that it's body. London dry. 80. And that is a section, but we'll get to that. 80%. And then the 20%. And then the original majority of the people that are into gin will tell you that it started in Holland. But they're not, they're not watching this because they already know all this. Yeah, but it, it, neither of them are right. Those are not correct. It's actually made in Mesopotamia. It started in my basement. Th that's actually box. the truth. <laughs> gin started gin. gin. The origin of gin is traceable to the Italian monks in northern Italy that were already producing herb-based liqueurs for medicines. So, you're, I mean, that's what, I mean, it's gin, isn't gin a neutral grain spirit with herbs? Macerated inside and yeah, so I mean it's not like but it has to have crazy science. It has it's, to have juniper and the okay. concentration of juniper is in northern Italy. Okay, is there a percentage that has to be from juniper? Because I know we're no, gonna go. No, it with just the, has to have juniper. With, with the Geneva, it's but uh, the juniper thing is 
is that's a hard and fast requirement. Like Scott yes. has to be from Scotland. It just has to have juniper. So if I just put a juniper essence, one drop, boom, gin. gin. Heck yes, I'm making my own gin. It's gonna be pure alcohol with a drop of juniper. Oh, okay, so train. anyway, we're in the 11th, um, 11th century in Italy, and the monks are producing this gin-like substance. It had juniper in it, so technically it's gin, but at this point, it wouldn't even remotely taste like gin. That's because they didn't have wives. Well, they were using a malt wine as their base instead of a neutral grain spirit, okay. and it tasted so foul that they were adding the juniper to it to try to mask the taste of how bad it was. Oh, so it's like a screwdriver. Yeah. 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 Vodka. Okay, so 500 years go forward, and the expansion of the monks and this juniper malt wine is expanding out into the other countries in Europe, and the Dutch at this time period are finally starting to get their legs around distillation, and they're building factories for distillation purposes, and the process of turning this product that had been made for 500 years prior into a mass-produced product was a very simple process. Huge. That's where the Geneva... Bring it up here. There you go! The Geneva comes into play. This is the very first step in the lineage of gin. Balls Geneva. Balls! Original recipe, superior quality. Okay, those don't have to go together. But, <laughs> um, so in 18... Would you say 1820? No, because we're in the 1500s. Oh, crap! So this is this is a newer bottle. Well, no, the, the <laughs> recipe from this and right. the production of the company is probably later on. But the concept, the, of, the concept of what we're talking about is 1500s at this point. Okay. All right. So the bigger put pitch in this point is is that continuous distillation has not been invented yet. So the only way to distill a product at this point is pot stills. So the quality of this gin should be more like a whiskey than it is like a traditional gin. Why? Because pot stills impart more impurities than continuous distillation. So a continuous distillation, like I know that they have them at, um, what the hell's that place right there? Which one? These guys, don't they? No, they use pot stills. Do they use pot stills? Then what's like, yeah, you're right, because they should have me. Yeah. So the, what's, what is the, how do they do continuous distillation? It just keeps recycling into No, it's all so out, continuous or? distillation, un, unlike pot stills, Pot stills, the vapor rises into the column, right. and then it's chilled, and it turns back into an alcohol. Bloop, 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 bloop. Continuous distillation is the act of pouring the alcohol into the top of the still, mm -hmm. and it has plates in there, and each plate is heated up to uh, a point to where it strips out each individual layer as it appears. trickles down because right. the um, vapor is traveling up through the column. So the stuff goes down, it rains down. It rains down. The vapors go up. And then the hot vapors go up, and each plate it gets has... Caught. Well, each plate is a different temperature, and at that temperature in the certain plate, that's where pure alcohol will start to pour out. And so it gets trapped, and then it siphons it out? Well, no. The, uh, water well, everything else water and stuck. alcohol are going to separate at different, different temperatures. Right. So if it's less hot at the top of the still than it is at the bottom of the still. Water's down here. Yeah, water is going to change out differently than alcohol vapor. Right. So they're they're breaking up all the impure. They're they're basically hitting different temperatures to get all the different impurities out. Exactly. Right. And then then there's the the new one, the cold still. I mean, what about those? Have you seen those? Yeah, like that's that that's the Oxley one. Oxley do. Yeah. What they're doing is they're just they're they're, they're super. Yeah. They're vacuuming out the alcohol. They're pulling out the ethanol with cold. And then cold. they can use cold to boil. <laughs> that's exactly. cool. But expensive. Okay, so we're getting off the topic here. Well, I think that's that kind of makes a bit, I mean, that's like your foundation. If you don't understand how that works, then this might not be as important. So now you understand that this is going to have, any of the Genevers are going to have more of a whiskey characteristic. So what we've decided to do is I wanted Derek to be able to try it first. Man, I'm, I've actually had not tried this for like at least a year and a half. Yeah. Because that is my bottle. Yeah, right? yeah, that's yours. We have a signed Ooh. one too. It smells like sake. It does. Okay. It smells like sake. Like a rice. I can see that. Put it in your mouth hole. No, oh, my mouth hole. Hold on. Oh, it smells like kind of brown. <laughs> I'm rinsing. Okay. Mm. It does have a little, it was oaky. Yeah. Hey, man. And then hey, what man. I've set up for both of us is, is that one off of a gin and tonic. I like the oakiness. It's better than the last time I had it. I think it aged well in my bottle. Oakiness kind of travels through the gin and tonic too. So we have gin and tonic here. Yeah. And why'd you go with that? Because the aeration and the bubbles and every, this is the most common cocktail. And I would say that this is probably the most common gin cocktail that you can make. 
but you don't use lime. No. So this one is gin and tonic. That's it. If you want lime, you can add lime, but if you add lime to this now, it's gonna part lime. Yeah. Maybe we don't want that. No. What if there's lime in there? You're not gonna get those nuances of lime. Mm -hmm. it, no, it's definitely got maltiness to it though. Mm -hmm. Like a, like a, like a malt beverage. Yeah. Like a cold 45. Yeah. Probably higher class. Mm. Good? Yeah. Okay. Jennifer. What? Should we shut that off? Is that like, hey, go upstairs and shut it off? Yeah, why don't we do that? Okay. Keep going. So, 1585, we're now traveling into the Eight-Year War. 1585. So it's only been 85 years. Okay. So that's the last sip I took. Yeah. And the Dutch and the English are fighting a war, and right now the royals in England have gotten to the point where they're sick of the French. And they've come to the Actually, conclusion that all of the things in the country of England that everybody is drinking are either brandy or wine. And the consumption of both of these things are driving the king crazy because he's like, well, we need to have our own product because I'm tired of giving oh, all of our money. Oh, because you import it? Yeah. You have to import brandy too? Yep. Why can't they make that? They just were getting all of it out of France. Huh. Okay, so what ends up happening is, is that during the Eight-Year War, all of the guys from um, Holland are fighting in this war are smashed on gin. Pussies. Super, like super drunk. They only have eight years. They're already worried about that. And they're running headlong right into gunfire. Hmm. Okay, so... That's... <laughs> it's it's like a bravery thing. Yeah. The outcome of that is the terminology was then put into practice of Dutch courage. Because they were saying these guys are, are so courageous, that's Dutch courage. That was coming from the gin. So the guys that were fighting in that war went back to Britain and go, we, we want that. Gin. We need gin. So the... The people in Holland at this point go, yay, let's just make gin our thing. We'll send it off to England and everybody's happy. I do that. So they start doing that. Capitalize. And right around 1606, so there's only a little bit of time where this Dutch gin is flowing into England. The um, government in Holland decided that it wanted to start taxing gin. So it starts Obviously. taxing gin. Oh, but that makes exporting harder, right? Exactly. So now the people in Britain are like, what the fuck? We really like gin now. But it's double the price. But it's double the price. So what the British government said is they were like, you know what? We like gin so much. People are really into it. We're going to make it legal for anybody to make gin. Sounds good to me. That would be what we do. Makes okay. It's marijuana. <laughs> the legalization of gin starts the down spiral of the oh. British government down for... Spiral a good 30 to 40 years. Like, it goes into a point Why where... Why is it down spiral? It sounds like it should be up. Everybody was wasted, and it turned into what was known as mother's ruin. Well, they should learn how to moderate, dude. You yeah. don't have to always get drunk. But the, the, the quality of the product that was being made was made in, like, bathtubs in London. Bathtub gin. Yeah, but it was... People also take baths in those. Yeah, but it, we're talking about a time period where people would put, like, strychnine and acetone yeah, and, like, other things in the product. Because it worked. Yeah, as so... As you don't die. This whole time period takes in, and the, the amount of people drinking gin in London just explodes. Because everybody's making it, everybody's drinking it, but they're drinking terrible product. So the British government finally catches on to the fact that they have kind of like lost their mind and things have gone crazy. And the importation of brandies and wines have taken a drastic down spiral because right. everybody's drinking this bathtub gin. It's cheaper. So in 1751, almost 100 years later. That the, takes a long time, dude. Yeah, the, the British government finally comes in and like stops the production of bathtub gin and these backyard um, distilleries and makes it to where the only people that can make gin at this point are bars. Hey, dude, that that, that take a lot longer than... I mean, 100 years, that's like a lifetime for certain people. Yeah. Hey, you, go. Uh, yeah, that seems like a little obnoxious. It would take 100 years... Dude, even Obamacare was covered. It, it, that just seems, that's ridiculous. That's a whole lot of drunk people for 100 years. That means an entire population from birth to death, you were pretty much drunk. Yeah. That is a definite problem. Okay, so what ends up happening is, is that the British government then takes it upon themselves to regulate gin back into the bars. The bars then get the most amazing idea that they've ever come up with, and this is where one of the nerdy things that I'm totally into Make better comes gin. out of it. The act of using gin and drinking gin was very frowned upon because everybody looked at it as mother's ruin still. 
So there's people that are still addicted to gin and want to get gin, but they don't want people to see them buying gin. So the invention of the ATM system paperback is then invented. The the automatic telling machine. Yes. Is that what that stands for? So Old Tom Gin Teller, I think. is oh. a product that is the middle ground between the Genevas and the London Dries. This is the missing link between both of them. Okay. This product right here is dark. The middle product between the whiskey product and what will soon become the London Dry product. The Old Toms were a Do you want this name so people could see it towards the um, cats, like little wooden cats that were outside of the bars. And what you do is you'd slide a coin into the cat's mouth, and the bartender would pour a shot down the, its little tiny paws, and you would take the shot out of the paws of the, of the cat in the alleyways. And the cats were called old toms. Wait a minute, slow down. Okay. <laughs> Why would they, how would they know the quarter came through? There's somebody who just sits there at this little thing yes. waiting yeah. for gin. But gin invented the ATM system. Cause you, but it's not as automated as we would have thought because they had somebody on the other side. Yeah, but we're, we're talking about the very beginning of the ATM system starts with this one product. I, I, that, hey, and at some point, I bet you they put a service charge if you were out of your <laughs> Yes. Okay, so can this... We, can we drink that? Yeah. So, so I'm going to start brown? you with this. But it's brown. It is brown. Is that from running down the cat's... <coughs> no. <coughs> this is a pro Oak? Okay, so what have we learned about brown products? I can tell you one What's thing. the only thing that changes the color in the product? Filtration. No. Not even close. Maturation. Ma match ma you mean like putting stuff in there? Putting it in wood. Okay, so not like you know, maturation, matur like maturation, maturing something. Yeah. So yeah. So we know that the color of this has out. something to do with it being stored in a barrel. Because Unless of the color of it, we know that it's not a long period of time. We know that. Yeah, because if it had more color to it, it means that it had been. A oh, yeah, as long as it was always in a barrel. Yeah, if you leave that in the barrel for like twenty years, it's going to be look the color of a barrel. Exactly. It would look like the difference between añejo and a, and a blanco. So, but you could also filter to make it clear. Yeah. Right? So, drink up and tell me what you think of Mr. Old. First Tom. off, I'm going to tell you right now, it's definitely got juniper. Yes. And caramel, or something, vanilla. Tastes like gin. Oh, still oh, pot, funny. still pot distilled at this point. Yeah, but the finish is different. Um, it, okay. Cool. It's a, what, what? What is that? What do you mean? It's got a. Give me this. It's got a funny finish. Botanicals. No, it has everything. Uh, there's one of these. Maybe it's cardamom. There's coriander. This is really cool. It's got a lot of complex flavors. I just can't pick out which one I'm getting. Like, there's a specific flavor that I'm getting in the finish that. Now, something to note with Ransom is, is that these are batched. This is batch number 41. Um, each batch tastes different. Oh, that's a hard time. Yeah. So, so like, if you there. really fall in love with 41, um, you, you should probably them. buy as many of those as you can because they do change out relatively quickly. But I thought the whole goal with a master distiller is to make sure that doesn't happen. Yeah, well, with a company like this, this is a micro distillery. So they're doing it as a marketing technique. Yeah. That's fine. Okay. We have t we have Tiki well, that does that, it, right? Berkshire Ethereal is like that, too. It comes in batches, and the batches go away seasonally. Okay. So, well, okay, so here ready. is the gin and tonic with our friend Old Tom. So, and, and there's, I bought an Old Tom. It's not here yet. It was supposed to be here for this, but it's not. Yeah. There's Old Tom as a category. It yes. like Geneva. Mm -hmm. You can get other Genevers that aren't bought. You can get other Old Toms. That aren't Ransom. Yeah. Right. Did I buy a Ransom? So yeah. this is exactly what I bought? Yeah, but you might have a different batch. Dick. No, probably not. Why would it be? I mean... You never know. True. Oh, it makes the uh, quinine jump out. Yeah. Yeah. Heavy on the quinine! Oh, wow. What type of what type of tonic is that? Um, Premium. Oh, wow. That is quinine up in your grill. Oh, it's polar! That's not even quinine. That's like... Did they have quinine in polar? Yeah. yeah. But this is a premium uh, tonic. Premium? Yeah, this is the old-fashioned recipe. See? Traditional recipe. Does it actually have real sugars? With natural quinine. Uh-oh. But does it have sugar in it? Um, high fructose still. Let's they find out. still use high fructose. Contains carbonated water, high fructose. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you can't get... It's hard to get... Uh, you have to get those tiny bottles. Um, fever tree. Yeah. Those are the best. 
You can get them at, I, we, I haven't found an economical reason to sell them at the store, but I know you can buy them at specific specialty stores. Usually it's not shippable stuff. Okay. It's just too hard. 1800s, uh, Floraxia comes into pretty much Europe and destroys every single grape crop in the entire country. Floraxia is the disease, right? Yep. It's like botulism for plants. Yep. It <laughs> destroyed pretty much the entire cognac, brandy, and wine market in the entire but that's okay because we're talking about gin exactly so so that goes your wine there goes all your other crap no brandy you have to treat gin now you're gonna drink gin more gin and scotch and rum and that's it okay is this before scotch had used bourbon barrels it's the so reason bad. that scotch became as prevalent as it is today is because of floraxia uh. okay Thank you, Floraxia, <laughs> in the chat room. Doesn't it sound like a username? I know. Okay, so Floraxia comes in, kills off wine and brandy. Gin takes a huge leap in notoriety throughout the entire country. Because you have no options. Yeah, well, it, in, in the entire continent of Europe, it, it just blows up. Okay? Here is the next step in our evolution of gin. 1831, Anna's Coffee invents the coffee... Uh, okay the continual distillation still oh okay okay what this does is it, it then makes scotches mass producible and blendable but it also makes it to where gin is now mass producible because the neutral grain spirit is easily made for the base of the gin okay and that's where our next best friend comes into play and Aww. that is Tangare! Man, you can maybe drink Tangare. Drink Tangare. So Tangare. Yeah. Thoughts? I actually like Tangare. Really? Yeah, it's I find that it's a little bit easier in the <laughs> London drag category than the rest of its family members. Did, did God install your brain backwards? Huh? <laughs> I mean, dude, this is not no. You no oh, really. Yeah. You made me do this? Yep. Oh, it's Christmas time! Yay! Oh, oh. It's like pure. Oh. See? That's what I'm talking about. When you have to do that, when you have to like channel your inner human to keep yourself alive through that shot, oh. that's not good product. It's bad. It just tastes awful. Like people taste gin, they're like, I hate gin. What do you drink? Dangere. No. Have Don't do that. Have you had Ungava gin? U N G A V A. No. Okay, into the tonic. I'm sure that this will taste well, amazing. It's kind of freaking water it down a little bit. Oh, please, God, please, God, please. You said you like this stuff, and now you're all praying. Yeah, kind of watered it down. Yeah. Thank God. Dude, I just have this thick thing. Like, if you can't, if, if suffering through straight drinking, mm -hmm. and then, oh, well, if you put it in, if you water it down, everything's good, then, then there's something wrong. Yeah. I mean, it's so juniper forward and dry and whatever that is that makes us do that with our face. Uh-huh. But you don't get the quinine as much. Yeah. Okay. So we're now into the late 1700s. And people are traditionally in Britain drinking our wonderful London dry friend and enjoying it immensely. But the social status of gin has now taken a nosedive. Because of this? No, it's just the time period. People over a period of time, especially this length of time, have just gotten sick of it. Oh, yeah. And whiskeys, Irish whiskeys and scotches have kind of like taken the role as the premium product of the 1700s. Um, brandies have kind of like started to slowly come back, mostly because of the fact that... Um, this is going to sound so crazy, but there is a strain of grapes in Texas that were transplanted to um, Europe and crossbred with the grapes to fight off the floraxia. Mm. So if it wasn't for Texas, there would be no cognac, no wine, and no brandy in Europe. And if, see, there's something good about Texas right there. For yeah, you no one would ever Everything's guess. Everything's bigger in Texas. Texas saved the wine market. Thank you, Texas. Thank you, Texas. For creating a, a breed of plant that is superior to other plant breeds. Okay, so... We are now getting into a time period of kind of an interesting point with the British government where the British government at this point is traveling all over the world, taking over these new territories, doing all this crazy stuff. 
and the people that are working in the British Navy are being rationed out pretty much a big hefty portion of rum. Yes. Okay. Now this is a point in we need to do this history long. where rum takes on a interesting segment where they were getting gypped by certain sea captains and the, they were getting watered down rum and they were getting pissed about it. What so what they would do is they would take their rum and they would put it in water and they'd light it and if it would still flame, it was up to proof. The proof! If it didn't flame, it was overwatered and they had gotten gypped. So the sea captains are giving out rations of rum, but the sea captains were not of the same social class as the workmen in the boat. So they needed to be given a ration of something other than watered down rum. Watered down rum, so they were given gin. Oh. Now the only gin distillery that was close enough to the naval yard was in Fireworks. No. Was Plymouth. So Plymouth it capitalizes on their on their area at the right time. Yes. They're like they're exactly the opposite of the Dreamcast. Yes. <laughs> so Plymouth comes in as the closest um, distillery to the naval yard, and that's one of the reasons why the little ship is on the front of it. Because he saved the world. But each new vessel that was sent out by the British Army came with kind of like one of these thank you captain gift bags. And that captain gift bag came with two bottles of Plymouth rum. And or Plymouth gin. True fact. Gin. If it wasn't for Plymouth gin, Columbus would have never made it over here. True fact. <laughs> just making that up. Well, considering 1492 versus 1800, yeah, it's kind yeah, of yeah, probably. I was like, but maybe Magellan. No, nope. he was like a vampire, <laughs> like sea captain. Yeah, yeah, he lived on. Gin, and <laughs> okay, that's why he lived for 150 thousand years. So, the invention of the gin and tonic is because of Plymouth. They needed to water it down. Well, no, the sea captains at this point are traveling around um, South America and the Caribbean and South um, South Africa, and they're coming up with malaria. And they're coming up with scurvy. That's when they invented Rose's lime juice. Yep. But the two ways of dealing with that smart. were the lemon and the lime mm -hmm. and the quinine from the tonic water. So how do they make tonic water then? How do they get They lemonade? already had it. They wasn't exactly the same kind of thing that we have today, but they had quinine. So it's probably a flat yeah. tonic water. So the use of this was building the gin and tonics, which we would know today. Except for ours are better because they're full of carbonation. Yeah. So let's start with. The yeah, we had ice. We had ice. The Plymouth. So 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 what are your thoughts on this? Hey, he's got muck on the back. I like Plymouth. I think it's a good product. It doesn't have a lot of nose. It tastes like grain alcohol. Or smells like grain alcohol. Well, still continuously uh, continuous distillation. So that ruins its character because it gets it filtered too much. Mm. That's a little hot. Whoa. Yeah, a little hot. It's not as it's not as juniper as this, mm -hmm. but it tastes more like closer to a 151. I think it's a higher proof too. Oh, is it? Um, 41. 40. Oh, so I'm I'm not 82. that sensitive. Yeah, <laughs> it's only two percent, but it feels like it feels like about a 50 percent. I think that they have a navy strength one that's like a 90 proof, but dude, yeah, that is already pretty up in your grill. Okay, so now we're gonna jump into our wonderful gin and tonic. So this is like what these. You're like the Willy Walker of gin, dude. <laughs> <laughs> what am I drinking? Oh, I don't have to smell this because it doesn't have. To See, I like this a lot. Sweeter. Mm -hmm. Whoa, twenty-nine in the finish. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my, my, I think something's beating on my tongue. It's like that alien creature just pops out. Okay, so the. <laughs> the beginning morphology of gin is pretty much at its completion at this point. That is dry. And I want to try it again. We are now into the segment of what I would like to refer to as the modern style of gin. Okay. So Plymouth is a modern to you? No. Yes, okay. Okay, so we're going to cut forward almost about 100 to 300 years. It's in that realm somewhere in there where the city of London is starting to take over and grow at such an exponential rate that these factories that house these gin distilleries just no longer had the room. They couldn't suffice these gigantic factories because they needed that space for people to live. So these That's distilleries important. started pushing out farther and farther into the countryside and got to the point to where majority of these products are now being produced in Scotland. Because they just kept climbing, that'd be north, right? Yeah. 
the majority of all neutral grain and all single grain is produced in the lowlands of Scotland. And that like, means that mate, get out of my land. The neutral grain product that's used in almost ninety percent of all London dries is made in Scotland. Is this why we have the movie Braveheart? No. Oh. <laughs> you know what's a funny thing about Braveheart? It's awesome. Is, is that they were not wearing kilts until 300 years after that whole thing happened. They weren't really wearing, wearing kilts, though. They were wearing, like... No, no, it's it's a misconception. Because in the movie Braveheart, they were all in kilts. They weren't wearing kilts until 300 years after that But it makes thing. for a better movie. Just saying. <laughs> okay. You ruin everything! You're like that guy in Big Bang Theory! Okay. So now we're going to move into the Scottish category of gin. So all these um, neutral grain spirits are being made in Scotland. And <laughs> it only made alive. sense that at a certain point that the Scottish would start producing their own gin. And some of the most delicious gins that you can pr like pr buy today are produced in Scotland. 44%. Um, That's two more percent. Hendrix is one of my favorites. But there is also... Um, one that has like this old guy on the front and it's a huge high proof one. Remember we tasted that one? I think you might actually still have it. It would be on that shelf. Um, if there's an old guy on it. Bulldog? No, it's not a Bulldog. I actually left it with you. It would probably be one of those. No, that's a no. RR. No, I don't think you still have it, you, but it's like I, a tall I didn't ball. get rid of it. Yeah. You did. Okay, so it doesn't matter. It's you! Card. Okay, so the next one in our group, which would be this bad boy, is our Hendrix, and this is our Scottish category of the modern group. It smells like vegetables and gin. <laughs> you get the, you still get the cuke, the cukes, and you get the the gin, juniper. Why does it always taste like cucumber to me? Because it has cucumbers infused in it. What? English cucumbers. Oh, they're so much different. Yeah. They have an accent. <laughs> <laughs> they're very moody cucumbers. <laughs> I'm here for the comic relief. I know nothing about chin. Um, that is the easiest one out of, like, Plymouth, punch you in the face. Tangeray make, makes me want to hang myself. Yeah. Um, this one is is pretty mild. Okay, so I mean, let's a little, go. A little dry, but not. Let's not go as, into a Hendrix and tonic and see what It is think. still kind of hot after the finish. It it's warms, warms your soul. Yeah. Even a little bit sweeter, but fall. It's like sweet, and like two seconds later, quinine in your grill. No, yeah. but um, more. I I want to say it's less honestly less complex than some of these earlier ones. Mm -hmm. uh, but a little little easier. Like I feel like this will target a broader audience. Yeah, those ones there. While they're more complex, that doesn't complexity doesn't necessarily rule as being the best of everything. Well, there's a lot of cool flavors in here. Still. Niche makes, you know, there's a certain audience for those flavors. It's like absinthe, right? Good, they could be complex, but some people just don't like it. That's easy, to, I think, for most people to drink. Yeah. If they can drink like gin. There are oh. people who just don't like gin. Yeah. Okay, so we are now into the very last category of the modern group, and that is the new group, which is the micro distiller group. group. This is a gin made in South Boston. Um, the guys that make it are awesome. I spend a lot of time over there um, shooting the shit with them. But this is... They have parties. They, well, yeah, they have parties, and they're just nice guys. Um, if you ever get a chance to go visit the distillery, I highly recommend They'll it. They give you tours. Yeah, they give great tours. And Where does the American gin fit in? Um, the very end. This is American. Yeah, so we've now crossed the ocean, and we're now into the micro distillery movement that's taking place here in America. And we're going to do Wireworks. Thank you! The guy who ran around Lexington and Concord. What's his name? <laughs> Paul, Revere. Paul Revere. Thank you, Paul Revere. Oh, I'm so glad. To, I'm so proud to be an American. This just smells good. Honestly, it has a little bit of heritage all the way across. I get more orange, but I get a little bit of, a, of an oaky sense to it. No. Yeah. Or something. Maybe it's malt. And almost like that aroma that they use in kitty litter. But we can let that go. <laughs> Mm. What would you know about kitty litter? He spends cat. a lot of time chewing on kitty litter. That's when I was a kid. Um, God, I, my babies are always had cats. Dude, that's is that even got alcohol? Can you sniff the kitty litter? Holy crap! It's forty-five. This is the highest of all of them, mm -hmm. and it tastes like not the highest of all of them. Yeah, this is really tasty. Um, I I am a fan of American gins. First off, not as dry. This is probably still a dry gin, right? 
No, no, it doesn't taste. Uh, so it has a little bit of sweetness, but it, it's it's got that zesty orange. Like I like the American category to me. Is this just a lie? But it seems like American gins tend to have more orange botanical than juniper botanical. Um, just I think it would be, be if way. I say yes, it's a gross generalization, but I think... I'm into gross generalization. I think the best way to place it is, is that the American products are going to use more expensive botanicals because they can get away with it. What do you mean get away with it? Because like a company like Tangeray or somebody... In well, the, they're not going to change their colors. They've been doing this for millions of years. Yeah, it's not just that. It's the price. Like they're selling so much gin that by adding more cost to it, it just it becomes... When you, the minute you say small batch... Things always are better. Like small batch, eh, micro brew. It can go either way. Sometimes. Well, if you make a very bad small batch, you don't last long. Yeah. So. If you make a good small batch, you're around. Let's for a while. go into the American gin and tea. What about New Amsterdam? That's an American product. What? What do you think? Oh, we already know what you think. We yeah. did the blind tasting. Came in like second or first. Yeah. First. First. Yeah. No, mm -hmm. ethereal came in first. I think. Mm. Mm-hmm. It came in within the top three. Yep. Whoa. Still, quinine comes right through. Like, wicked dry in the finish. Yeah, it was super time. Yeah. But that's the... It's got to be the little tonic, because this was... I'm going to tell We're you We're using what, good tonic for this whole thing. But this gin tastes better without this tonic. Like, yeah. some of them, they, they had... They were, it was like Tangeray. Yeah. Right? It was better. This is better straight. This would be better... I would like this better in, like... Cocktails? Yeah. Yeah. Or um, a martini. If I, I don't like gin martinis. Yeah. God, it's dry. But if if I like gin martinis, I would rather have this product than any of those. Secondly, probably Hendrix because it's kind of, no. I don't know. This is this is cool. But you know what? I we've obviously have talked about Hendrix a lot. We've made we've went through like four bottles in a, in a contest, right? Yeah. So for me, Hendrix is sort of like. I just know Hendrix. Yeah. That is not something I've had before, so it's entertaining and interesting and different. Yeah. So there's a lot to be said for having something that's different. Yeah. Having a couple bottles, like if you have Hendrix and that's what you use all the time, fine. But you know what? Sometimes if you have something like that and you make something with that, things are just different. It's like using a different tequila when you make a margarita. Woo! <laughs> um, anyway, so... I, you know, I like to have the variants. I think this, though, if I was to be a gin drinker, or people are like, I don't like gin, what should I try? I don't know if you can get this. I think you can. You can get it on Trink Up New York, right? I think so. Because I think that's where, we're, yeah, I think you get this. Oh. TrinkUpNewYork.com. Google, not, you don't Google it, just go there and, and see if they have this. If you're in the U.S. and you can get it, because I think you can try but if whiskey. You, shit, if, you but don't, if you don't have access to that through Drink Up, I think that it's getting to the point now where... There is a micro distillery Grand pretty much in com. every single country or every single state in the union at this point that's making a gin. Right. It's like micro brews. Yeah. At some point, you know, we have breweries. And that's the cool thing about breweries is you can go to different places to get different beer for the region. If you're in a gin and you go to different places to look for it, it is a little harder to then say, I'm going to Washington. I'm going to Seattle. Where do I go to get the local gin? Not the same as saying I want to get a local brew. You go to any no, beer, it's any getting pub, to the point where getting there. But if you go to any pub, you can get the. You local know how beer. you do this is you go to the American Distillers Institute. It's called the ADI, mm -hmm. and then right on the front page is a list of every single micro distillery in the country and their address and their phone number. Yes, and that would be what you do if you were into wine, right? You do the same thing. Yeah, you go. But for people who drink beer, it's a little different. You know, from a broad audience, people just say, like, "I'm going to a local sports bar. I'll get a local brew." You, you go to the local bar. You yeah, but you, get you go to the sports gym. bar, you have to pay for that beer. If you take a tour... You don't pay for anything. No. Well, you pay for a general tour. Usually. Yeah, and then you get to taste all these really cool right. gins and tequilas or whatever they're working well, on. I'm totally encouraging it. I'm just saying it's yeah. it's not the same level as There's a actually. I was just in Portland, Oregon a month ago? Yeah. A month ago? And they had a passport of... They had, like, I think it was something ridiculous, it's like 12 like distilleries. And no, they gave you like a book passport. Oh, like a wine, like and you a, got you know, stamped Sonoma. at every yeah. single distillery. And if you if you completed the whole thing at the very last distillery, there's a special like special yeah, taste. Off. Oh, okay. no, something special that you could only taste. But you, could, you have to be a master of your craft, which means you have to have taste <laughs> everything. They say congratulations, you're drunk. Yes. <laughs> well, you you. You, if you get every stamp in the place, when you get to the very last distillery, how far you, you get. Go. I think it's Rogue has the special taste. There's something special at Rogue. Rogue? Yeah. The brewery? It, it's also a distillery. Interesting. Yep. So, 
Um, that completes I'll the morphology of gin. Hopefully, this was educational, and it's not going to like make you be like, I don't understand. Well, that's why you just send Kurt an email. Yeah. Or any um, Jen, any questions in the nothing nope. in there that people were like, I don't understand. Nope. Okay, so makes sense. Um, Derek has given you opinion on what you should be buying, and I think that wraps it up. So close her up. All right, we're done. If you have any other questions, you can always comment. If you have recipes you want to submit, gin based or otherwise, you just type recipe at everydaydrinkers.com. Boom. Send it over to us. I also put in facebook.com slash cocktail TV. There's now a little link where you can click to submit your recipe right there. You don't even have to go to our website, everydaydrinkers.com. But that's it. Uh, thank you, Curtis, for having the lowdown. Hopefully, request what you guys would like to see if we did. I, Curtis has to go do research. So don't expect, like, next week, all of a sudden, we know everything about fucking vodka or... I know a lot of this cow. stuff already, so... Well... But you get, you know, it's, there's some research involved at yeah. some level and note taking. So think about that and think what would be cool to learn about, you know, and have him do the research if he doesn't already know it. Personally, for me, um, if I had to be greedy, I would, I'd like to know, uh, I always like to know more about bourbon because it's fun and tasty. And to do this in front of bourbon is always a good time. Mm -hmm. um, vodka is interesting because it's so generic and like people, they're, it's very trendy, mm -hmm. right? But uh, I'm not that excited about vodka. Uh, rum, though. Curd. I want to know everything about rum. I'm teaching a two-part class on rum January. Dude! I know. We're there. Sign up for that shit. I don't even know how you do that. But anyway, there you go. EverydayDrinkers.com for more. We're teaching you how to drink. <laughs>